Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Hey everybody, this is the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast, and you are listening or watching episode number 11. If you don't know who I am, I am Patrick Norris, the curator and founder of Red Ink Revival, and our goal today is to help you lead with a whole heart, a healthy brain, and a soul on fire. I'm so glad you're with us. Today's conversation in episode number 11 is with psychiatrist, master psychopharmacologist, international speaker, and author, Dr. Timothy Jennings. We'll talk through fear and intimacy circuits in the brain and dig deeper into insights into neuroscience and why we do what we do. If you're a geek about the details of the brain, you're gonna love this week's episode. We're gonna talk about where experience of pleasure comes from in the brain. We'll talk about how you process a loving God versus a distant or angry God and what the impact will have upon your brain. How that you can live in function or dysfunction of health based on how you frame God up. We talk about happiness and how to live in it in terms of managing the brain. We learn about fear-driven factors of leadership and how they undermine our own sense of self. Dr. Jennings' bio includes that he is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and fellow of the Southern Psychiatric Association. He's president and founder of Come and Reason Ministries and has served as the president of the Southern and Tennessee Psychiatric Associations. He's authored many books, including The God-Shaped Brain, The God-Shaped Heart, and The Aging Brain. He is married and lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he is in private practice. Dr. Jennings lectures and has written material that can be found at his website, comeandreason.com. As you can imagine, this episode number 11 is gonna be absolutely amazing. I can hardly wait for you to experience it. I'm so glad that you're here with us today, wherever you get podcasts or in the video version on YouTube, we do try to drop new content every week, shooting for each Thursday of the month. If this podcast is adding value to your leadership in life, do us a huge favor. We'd ask you to subscribe to the podcast, like it, comment in the reviews. And then an added bonus to us is if you could help us get the word out by sharing on social media platforms. Red Ink Revival Platform is for all leaders in every sphere of leadership. But I'm a pastor. My 30 plus years of senior leadership experiences have happened in the context of the local church and ministry. My stories are laden with church world stories. Yet the principles really do cross pollinate no matter where, where you lead and what sphere of life. Today's episode is brought to you in partnership with River Valley Conference and Marketing with Wisdom. River Valley Conference is an amazing pastor church leader conference. I landed at one of their one day events here in Kansas City and just was blown away. At River Valley Conference hosted in Minneapolis, Minnesota, you'll find a bunch of like-minded pastors and ministry leaders. The event is hosted by some top tier leaders in Rob and Becca Ketterling, along with the River Valley Church team. The conference takes place over two days to inspire and equip teams to build strong, thriving churches in their community. Dynamic speakers, powerful worship moments, and practical breakouts will inspire your team, bring insight and solutions to problems that you are facing. In fact, here's a a cool asterisk. Red Ink Revival's team will also be facilitating a breakout there. Come meet our team of psychologists and therapists. We'll be there ready to greet you and we can't hardly wait for what's going to happen in this entire conference. River Valley Conference is June 8th and 9th, 2020. Go to rivervalleyconference.com and for all our Red Ink tribe, use discount code Red Ink with no spaces, one word. Red Ink for $10 off. I hope we do get to see you there. Also check out my friend Marketing with Wisdom with Wisdom Moon. He's absolutely the best. They are a full service Christian marketing agency that works with churches, businesses, nonprofits, musicians, authors, and podcasters, and really a whole lot more. They're helping the Red Ink Revival brand get out into the world. So go check them out, marketingwithwisdom.com. 
be sure to tell them that Patrick Norris sent you. Let's go now to this week's episode number 11 with expert and author, Dr. Timothy Jennings. Dr. Jennings, it is just incredible to me to have you a part of our leadership podcast. I have so loved your books. I've enjoyed, I've seen videos, not only on YouTube, but somebody gave me a bunch of DVDs of yours. And uh, just the expertise, both in the area of neuroscience, uh, psychology, uh, and also your theology background. It's very, very cool. Um, you're an accomplished author. You're a psychiatrist, a master psychopharmacologist, and neurotheologian. Um, that's all a bunch of big words. What does all that even mean? And can you just go into a little bit of your background for us? Well, for me, you know, it means that I'm integrating uh, the principles of, uh, of God as revealed in Scripture with the uh, reality of creation that God has uh, has. Uh, uh, constructed humanity to operate, our brains, our minds, and how those things work. In my view is that we can only find well-being and health and harmony with God's designs for life, and those designs uh, transcend um, the, the physiological to the spiritual and the relational as well. And as we understand His designs for life and we harmonize with them, we experience ever-increasing well-being. And so in my materials, I try to integrate those, those truths from Scripture with, uh, with science and how real life works which is so amazing to me. I, being a pastor, have loved theology. Theology is a, a joy of my heart because it's where we attach. It's how we understand uh, the love of God and our place in how He receives us. Um, something about science has given me handles uh, where there sometimes in theology can be some ambiguity around subjective interpretation. What science does integrating with theology, uh, again, just gives me some amazing handles. I love your book, The God-Shaped Brain. In fact, I have it right here. And uh, the subtitle is How, Ch How uh, Changing Your View of God Transforms Your Life. In it, you talk about the brain's fear circuits. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that in the context of, of God? Yeah, yeah, I will. But I also want to uh, mention the purpose of the subtitle, Changing View of God Transforms Your Life, because of the law of worship. And one of, you know, God is creator. He builds reality and his laws are the laws upon which reality operate. Laws of physics, laws of health, but the, the law of worship. By beholding, we become changed. We become like the God we admire and worship. Wow. Um, and in psychiatry and psychology, it's called modeling, but the Bible actually uses the terminology or the phraseology, um, by beholding we become changed, we fix our eyes upon Christ. And the view of God we hold has a neurobiological con consequence, altering the neural circuits which fire, but also a, a characterological impact. We characterologically become like the God we worship. And wow. so that's uh, the, the real emphasis of the book, is to help bring out the truth uh, about God as revealed in Jesus. If you see me, you've seen the Father. Mm. And so with that in mind, um, you talk about the. You wanted me to mention the fear circuitry. You know, our, the way our brains are designed is our brains are actually responding to what our mind thinks. Um, the brain will process environmental stimuli signals, and so if you hear a loud bang, you might startle. But then your mind has to evaluate that and to make a decision. What was that? And if your mind says, "Oh, that was a car backfiring," that sends a signal to that alarm or stress or fear circuit, and you calm down. Uh, but if you hear the loud bang and you start on your mind goes, oh, that's a terrorist with a gun heading down to my office, then instead of turning off the, uh, the alarm, you actually gear it up more. And so um, what I describe in the book is that when the alarm fires, it sends a signal to our thinking circuits where we then have to make an intelligent decision about what's going on. If we ha have lies operating in our mind, misunderstandings, distortions, then typically that fires more fear circuitry and keeps us anxious and worried. And many people have these ruminating, worried, anxious loops yes. going where yes. they stay fearful, anxious, and stressed all the time. And when that happens, it sends a signal to our body, increasing uh, immune system and infl inflammation in our body, which actually undermines health. Insulin resistance, diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, strokes all go up if we stay in a chron chronic state of fear. 
It's just, it's just amazing. And I, I certainly resonate with it. I'm sure all of our podcast listeners also uh, recognize that there are fair circuits that give them these constant narratives. You use the words, uh, the brain circuitry, and then you separate that in the way you talked about the mind right there. Can you just talk just a little bit about the brain, the mind? How, what is the mind? Where does that fit? Where does it come from? That's a great question. And a, a simple analogy would be, if you understand a little bit about computers, there's hardware and there's software. Okay, Our brain would be analogous to the hardware. It's the machinery, the neurons, the glia, uh, the neural chemicals. Anything you can physically touch would be part of the machinery, the brain. The mind would be analogous to the software. It would be our memories. It would be our language. You and I have an English software package. Our language was not genetically pre-programmed before birth. It was uploaded by our environment. But I can't open your brain and touch English. It is just part of the operating system upon which your mind operates. And so our beliefs, our perspectives about God, our attitudes towards um, uh, others uh, of other races, other sexes, and so forth, um, th those, uh, those beliefs and perspectives are part of what we've learned through life, which become part of our mind. But the way our, our, we're designed by God, our brain responds to um, what our mind chooses. The brain does not make choices. The mind makes choices. But the brain adapts and changes based on the decisions of the mind. So, for instance, if you decide that you want to take golf lessons or piano lessons, your brain, you're not genetically wired or pre-programmed biologically to do those activities. That would be a decision of your mind based on a variety of influences in your environment, exposure, opportunity, friends. If you decide to take those lessons, though, then your brain begins rewiring pathways. So the more you practice the golf lessons or the music lessons, then you develop networks where your brain structure changes. So that becomes, you become more proficient at it and it becomes more automated. So your brain is responding to what your mind is thinking and choosing. So from you know, a Christian biblical perspective, you know, there seems to be the mind uh, in eternity. Uh, that a person has the capacity to still think, still remember, and so on. So is the mind a spiritual construct, or is it a part of the biological, natural person? So my understanding of what, God uh, what the Bible describes as the human being is that we are an integrated entity in which we have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Come on. And uh, you know, God formed the body out of the dirt of the earth and breathed in him the, the ruach or the panuma, if you want to use yep. the Greek, uh, from which you get pneumonia, the breath of life, yep. and he became a living psyche uh, soul. Yeah. Okay, and so the, the, uh, the analogy I use, if you look at your computer, your computer has hardware, it has software and it has energy, okay? And it takes all three to be operational. And uh, if you uh, separate the three, if you have a computer with a hardware and electricity but no software, it doesn't work. If you have software and electricity but no hardware, it doesn't work. And so the Bible describes that when the body breaks down and stops functioning, the Bible describes we go into a state of sleep. And what happens to your computer when it runs out of power? It goes into a state of sleep. But Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, don't be afraid of those who can destroy the hardware, the body, but can't destroy the soul, the psyche, the software. OK, and so it's really the information that makes your individuality who you are, which is contained in your software. And so if you have a computer that's backed up on a cloud, get your mind around that idea. Right, okay? right. And somebody, and somebody destroys the machine you're not terribly upset because you can download from the cloud all the data into an upgraded hardware and you have resurrected your machine. And so our individualities, our souls, our psyches are, are stored and safe with Christ in heaven. Okay, so when he comes, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I don't want you to grieve like those who have no hope about those who have fallen asleep. We know the Lord shall return and bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him and the dead in Christ rise first. And so in one passage, we have the dead coming up out of the ground, but also coming out of heaven, the same people, because he's bringing their individualities, their souls, their psyches, their unique personhood, the software, and downloading it into new hardware, and thus they live again. This is how I understand it. Uh, has anybody ever told you you're kind of smart? Because that, that's all a lot of a very uh, deep but illustrated kind of examples. That's, that's awesome. And... Uh, I'm just going to take a little bit to even chew on that. That's that's awesome. Um, let's talk just a minute. When, yeah. When, when, it to, when it comes to practical living today, though, this is important. 
Because um, what the Bible promises us here on earth today is yeah. not new hardware today, not new physiology. We get the new physiology when the mortal puts on immortality and when the corruption puts on incorruption at the second coming. Come what on. we're promised today, though, is new hearts and right spirits, new Come attitudes, on. new motives. We get software upgrades. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So the Holy Spirit comes in, and the old that was fear-driven, self-centered, watching out for me, deceitful, corrupt, gets replaced with love trust, righteous mm -hmm. virtue, and we see character transformation. So we get software improvements where our characters are transformed, even in the corrupt physiology we're still operating. Man, that's so good, man. That's good. Let's go back to the fear stuff. Where did fear originate? Where's that whole, whole concept start within us? Well, I believe the biblical um, narrative. And so it says in Genesis that as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they ran and hid because they were afraid. Yeah. Now, what was that about? Imagine you're in a loving, other-centered marriage relationship where you love and trust your spouse, and your spouse loves and trusts you. Yeah. And somebody comes to you and they tell you a lie that your spouse has been having an affair. Now, it's not true. Your spouse is faithful and loyal. But if you believe the lie that your spouse is cheating, does something inside of you change? Yeah. Right. Notice, lies believed break the circle of love and trust, and broken love and trust. Wow result in fear and selfishness. I don't want to trust you. I think you're cheating with somebody else. You're not getting in my bed tonight. Uh, in fact, I've got to get to the bank and, and get that money before you do. And so Adam and Eve believe lies about God. And when they believe those lies, it broke the circle of love and trust they had in God. Uh, God was still faithful, still loyal, still true, still righteous, still perfect. But they no longer believe that. They believe lies. So the broken circle of love and trust resulted in fear in them and selfishness. So they ran and hid because they were afraid. And they began to sow fig leaves and try to protect and promote themselves. Amazing. So what's the antidote? What are we going to do if we have this surging fear running through our brains? And it seems like that easily it gets out of manage, manageable control. So what, what's the antidote to this fear? So the Bible says perfect love casts out fear, mm. but Adam and Eve had love in Eden for God, but it got broken. So the Bible actually says there's two things required as an antidote. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so back to that analogy, you believe your wife has been cheating, but she hasn't been. Okay, and so you have, uh, have uh, either moved out or made her move out. You're separated. She still loves you. She wants you back. What does she have to do? She has to prove her innocence. The innocent one is on trial. So Paul says in Romans uh, chapter three, God, may you win your case when you uh, when you are when you are being tried. Wow. OK, God is innocent, but he's proven and revealing to us that he is truly trustworthy. So lies believe break the circle of love and trust. Truth believe destroys lies and restores us to trust. And in trust, we open the heart and says in Romans 5, 5, he pours his love into our hearts. And then that love, perfect love, casts out fear. And only, only love that comes from God is powerful enough to free us from the fear that actually dominates us and makes us self-centered and, and survival-driven. So as we're talking about fear and love, uh, there are places within our brain, I've heard you talk about this and you're so good at it, uh, help us understand from a neuroscience level where fear in the brain is firing off and then where does love, empathy, compassion, where's all that come from and how do they interact together? Yes, so the amygdala is the part of the brain that is our fear circuit. It's, this, it's the part that, that uh, fires when, when we're startled or when we are believing lies or when we're worried and we're feeling stressed and anxious and our blood pressure is going up. It's, it's what fires and sends a signal to our body, to our adrenal glands to release adrenaline and stress hormones and so forth. That's our fear circuitry. Now, the, there's a part of our brain that is near the front of our brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, and this is uh, one of the functions. It does several things, but one of the functions is where we experience empathy, compassion, concern for other people. Now, neuroscience has shown that when you meditate on a God of love, uh, and in this particular study, it was done 30 days, um, just 12 minutes a day, meditating on a God of love, they could measure growth in the anterior cingulate cortex, focusing on a God of love, your love circuits grew stronger and it was actually larger on the MRI scans. And the way our brain is wired, when your love circuits are active and firing the anterior cingulate cortex, it sends a calming signal to your amygdala, turning off the fear circuits and heart rate and blood pressure go lower because you're less stressed. So neurobiologically, love casts out fear. 
I want to invite you to one of our Red Ink Revival Leadership Retreats. Retreats are 40 hour plus intensive experiences led by psychotherapists, neuroscientists, and tenured pastors. These amazing intensives help pastors, staff, and marketplace leaders lead wholeheartedly in every sphere of life. Our retreats are profoundly helpful to you as you lead your organization. However, the most important person you will ever lead is you. Pastors and marketplace leaders struggle with the same emotional drivers. Statistics show that 70% of pastors struggle with depression and fear of inadequacy. 77% feel they do not have a good marriage. 90% are workaholics. 64% are engaged in secret activity around alcohol, drugs, and sexual behaviors. 84% wish they had a process friendship that they could confide in, but grieve the fact that they don't have such a person. Today's leaders are painfully struggling with depression, isolation, anxiety, and panic attacks, and then powerlessly ruminating over what coulda, shoulda, woulda been. Then to right the ship, leaders tend to chase the illusion that a greater performance and a greater success will quiet the enemy in their souls. But performance, even if gained, measured, and celebrated, never quiets the soul. These ruminating emotional states gain momentum over days, months, and years and give power to unmanageable behaviors like rage in marriage, avoidance as parents, or addictions like alcoholism, recreational drugs, pornography, or sexually acting out. For the spiritual leader, succumbing to one or more of these throws them into a firestorm of shame that ultimately keeps them in a cycle of bondage. Yet neurobiologically, we have learned that inordinate behavior is never about the ability to white knuckle discipline through the temptation. The behavior is driven by emotional griefs, losses, and relationship injuries from our backstories. These emotional memories become embedded into our brain's neurocircuits. Until these memories are addressed and appropriately reprocessed, the struggler will continue to grow in the struggle until there comes the day of public discovery and painful disclosure. Red Ink Retreats provide hands-on experiences in concepts, techniques, and coaching derived from theology, brain research, and psychological modalities. Our goal is to improve your individual leadership satisfaction, releasing a freedom for an energized life and a surprising greater performance. Go to redinkrevival.com and click the Retreats tab. You'll be inspired by previous retreat attenders. You'll hear their stories, and then you can dream of what could happen if you attended a retreat yourself. It might bring exponentially more fruitfulness to your organization. It might save your ministry, your marriage, your kids, and maybe even your self-respect. What is the value of leading wholeheartedly? So what are you waiting for? Go and register for our next retreat. Thank you for letting me share our Red Ink Retreats dream. Even within the Christian uh, world and in, in mindset, we have a lot of, of people who are told or think that they just, if they're struggling with fear, if they're struggling with uh, high stress areas, they just need to pray more. They just need to read the Bible more. But if we take a step back from that, we would have to say it's not just praying more, reading your Bible more. It's doing it from a love perspective. If you're looking at a God who's distant, critical, authoritarian, and so on, the fear within your amygdala is going to get inflamed. And so the prayer and even reading the Bible is, is not going to produce the experiences that you're desiring. But if you will shift and begin to see the truth, begin to address the lies and see God as a God who's benevolent, loving, he's in a good mood to you, he delights in you, all of the sudden it fires up the anterior cingulate cortex and you begin to move into the pleasure centers of the brain. Talk just for a minute, if you would, about the pleasure centers. Uh, what happens in the pleasure centers of the brain that the anterior cingulate cortex can access or release neurochemically so that a person is actually feeling happy and joyful and connected and, and contented? Can you, can you talk about that just for a sec? 
Yeah, but I want to validate what you just said because it's critical what you just said. And the view of God one holds. A lot of people think I just need to pray more or I just need to study my Bible more. Actually, there's been studies that look at that. It depends on your view of God when you pray. Uh, studies of, uh, of uh, Muslim refugees from Bosnia, uh, look at, most who had PTSD, looked at their coping and, uh, and their prayer life. And those who prayed for uh, for vengeance on their enemies, uh, for God to, to make them suffer, angry prayers, um, were compared to those who had prayers of grace and forgiveness. Wow. And those who had prayers of grace and forgiveness had much better adaptation, coping, reduction in uh, trauma experiences, wow. where those who prayed for vengeance on their enemies were not coping well and had more um, uh, trauma and anxiety problems. So just telling to somebody to pray is not sufficient. We really do have to come back to the truth as Jesus revealed. And then what happens when we come to the truth as Jesus revealed, then we do develop those higher circuits, those love circuits, and when those fire from the top down, God designed us to experience pleasure or joy in harmony with his designs. Wow. And so when we are beneficent to somebody, we share uh, a truth, we, we help somebody, there is a joy in doing that. We also get joy when we have you, have you ever had the joy of wrestling with a, a problem, uh, whether it's a math problem or a, a theological problem, but you may be wrestled with weeks, maybe months, but then the epiphany, the light yep. goes on and you see the truth. And yep. is there a joy in that, a pleasure in that? Come on. Okay. That's God's design, top-down activation of the pleasure circuits. Uh, a genuine other-centered love in your children and your spouse. Um, activities of achievement uh, where you achieve something, whether it's working in your yard and just cleaning the yard, and then you uh, step back and you look at a nice clean yard or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of joy in that. God has designed work as part, of, uh, as part of our well-being, and when we do a good job, we experience pleasure. So this is God's design. always top-down activation. One of the... Um, problems with addictions and one of the deceptions of Satan is to seek to stimulate our brain's pleasure centers directly without any um, uh, activity in harmony with God's design. So we're not seeking truth, we're not helping others, we're not doing work, we're taking a chemical or a substance um, or doing something illicit just to get a thrill, a momentary pleasure. Yeah. And this is very destructive to us. And what, and what happens is many people are pursuing happiness. And, and I get this question all the time, I just want to be happy. Well, um, here's a secret I'll tell your audience. Happiness is a byproduct. Come on. It can never be gotten directly. Like sawdust is a byproduct of woodworking. You can't get it directly, you have to do something else. And what it's a byproduct of is healthiness in all domains. And when we're unhealthy physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, we're not happy. And so if you're not happy, you should step back and ask the question, where am I not healthy? And where am I out of mm. harmony with the laws of health that God designed life to operate upon? Wow. And when you, you cannot have health while violating the laws of health, and you can't avoid the damaging consequences that come when you break them. However, reverse it. You can't avoid the benefits that come from harmonizing with them. That's how God's laws work. Yeah. And so as you pursue healthiness, the consequence is ever-increasing happiness. But people who are violating God's laws, whether it's spiritual laws or or moral laws or physical laws, they are not happy. So what they will do, they get tricked into seeking pleasure seeking, like drugs, mm. alcohol, illicit sexual relationships. They want to yeah. feel a pleasure in the moment because they're not happy. But those activities are almost always violating the laws of health. So they actually get less happy and, and then reinforce the pleasure seeking. Yeah, which, you know, we've got the guy in the Bible, Solomon, who had all the external characteristics of what people would pursue to be happy. And he was missing miserable, just vanity, vanity, all things are vanity. And it's interesting because uh, the pursuit of happiness really can be driven by fear, um, which is the very source of unhappiness. And when I think about how you're comparing, and even in your book, comparing fear and love, and how the circuits uh, interact, or, or how uh, the idea of being centered around love, which is Jesus's great commandment, love God, love people as you love yourself. So love God, love yourself as in kindness, compassion, and then love your neighbor. As you're doing that, it actually is the bedrock of all health, human health. And then you're free to go do all the other things that are, are healthy for you. 
Now, our podcast, we like to help leaders grow beyond just the tactical. Uh, So many times I'll listen to leadership podcasts, which are amazing and they're great tactical uh, resources. But if a person doesn't have an emotional construct, an integrated self, they're going to struggle at executing on these tactics that sometimes are pretty romantic. So when we look at the overactive fear circuits, when we look at anxiety, how does that show up in leadership behaviors? Yeah, so fear is the emotion that leads to survival drives. When Mm. people become afraid, they become less concerned for others and more concerned with self. And so those, uh, so fear leads to self-protection or extensions of the self institutional protection. And so what happens with people in leadership who are fear-driven, they become authoritarian. Mm. They become rule oriented. They become enforcers of rules, policers of breaches of rules. They use us uh, wow. methods of compliance to to try to lord over or dominate. They they will vilify people who see things differently than them. They will incite divisions and fa- fra- factions and, and, and try to solidify a base of support to attack those who see things differently than them. Um, some are threatened when they are questioned in leadership. How dare you question me? But the biblical principle, if you actually um, understand truth and love, truth can afford to be fair. It loses nothing by close investigation. And so the Bible principle in Romans 14 is every person should be fi- uh, fully persuaded in their own mind. So when we have truth and love in our hearts, we don't get threatened when people question us. We thank them for their question, validate them for searching, invite them to show us, well, if you have a better way, a better perspective, I only want to grow in truth. I'm finite. God's infinite. I'm I'm never going to be God. So there, there's always more for me to grow in in godliness. So maybe you've got a perspective to share it with me. Let's study it out together. And at the end of the day, though, um, if you're not persuaded in your own mind, you say, you know, I love you, and it's okay with me that you see it differently than me. And when you understand how reality works, the truth, you know, you can never avoid the truth. Yeah. You can only delay the day you deal with it. Come on. And so that's great. And so, so if people are out actually promoting a falsehood or a lie and you're in the truth, you don't actually have to argue with them. You can just say, well, let's give it time and see what unfolds. And the, the lies will always expose themselves. Um, people who come into your church, for example, and say, cigarette smoke helps our lungs work better. And we think everybody should smoke. Okay. <laughs> you don't actually have to. Uh, can, you can just say, well, okay, well, we'll just see what happens over the next few years. We're going to not do that. You do that. Yeah. And let's just see what happens to our health over the next next few years. Right. Oh, man, that's awesome. Well, as a leader, sometimes when you see this authoritarian expression in the spaces of leadership, you can begin to hear about how fear is driving it and then begin to implode with condemnation and shame and feeling like, uh, you know, I'm just a terrible person. But in reality, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that there's a backstory for all of us, and we know that there can be traumas, griefs, losses that impact the circuits of the brain and build a shame perspective that causes fear uh, to to drive our leadership. Uh, If you don't mind, because you're so good at, at breaking down the brain, help us understand what even childhood uh, losses, griefs, traumas, how that can impact us as adults, as leaders. Now that's a great, a great, uh, another great point. Um, when we're children, um, we come into the world because of Adam and Eve, uh, wired for fear and survival. Mm-hmm. We don't come into the world uh, with love dominating. We come wow. in with insecurity and fear. And this is where healthy parenting is so important. Healthy parenting, one of the the, the two prime pr- purposes of healthy parenting is to create atmosphere where love in the child's world is predominant. So they know even when they're making mistakes, when they're coming up short, that they have parents who love them and provide consistent, reliable, truth-based structure so that their experiential world uh, is uploaded and they grow up in an atmosphere where the predominant experience is truth and love. Yeah. Sadly, many parents have their own baggage, their own stuff they haven't worked through by the time they have children. And, there, and many children come up at homes where they don't experience consistent love and truth, and it's not nurturing. In fact, sometimes it's ex- exploitive and abusive. Yeah. And so 
just like, and I, so I tell kids, you know, think about how you learned your primary language, whatever your first language was. How did that happen? It wasn't didactic. It wasn't in a schoolroom. You simply assimilated from your environment, and it mm. wasn't possible for you to avoid it. You yeah. couldn't use your personal individuality to say, you know what, I grew up in an English-speaking home, but instead I'm going to learn German. Uh, that wow. It's not possible. Yeah. Okay. And and then and then once you come into adulthood, when was the last time you got up in the morning and said to yourself, you know, today I'm going to think in English? <laughs> we never do. Right. It's the only way how to think. Okay. Wow. So English language is not the only thing that gets uploaded in childhood. We upload all of these schemas, perspectives, filters, I call them, that um, we come into adulthood with from our childhood that we never purposely chose. They were just part of the experience. Yeah. But as an adult. Can we learn a second language if we want to? Come on. We absolutely can. We absolutely can. And so as an adult, um, the mature person can step back and say, you know what? I had some serious traumas and problems in my childhood that affected me. It wasn't my fault. It's, uh, it's not, it didn't happen to me because I'm bad. It happened to me because I was in that environment. Yes. Now, as an adult, though, I have a choice. I can either continue to deny, avoid, blame, uh, cast, uh, it's my parents' fault, I'm this way, make excuses and never actually heal all those wounds, or I can step back and say, you know what, I came into adult with a lot of wounds, adulthood with a lot of wounds. Um, I can't change my childhood, but through God's grace, I have the power to make choices to change me and get involved with good counselors, good programs, to begin bringing godly principles to bear in reviewing, you can't change history, but you can review and change what that history means to you today and how you respond to it. Oh, it's so, so good. Well, is there anything that pastors, marketplace leaders can do in the next 24 hours that will help them improve their life, family, faith, ministry, business from a construct of everything you've just, you know, talked about, fear, love, uh, being able to lead from a place that's centered in God loving you and so on. Is there anything in the next 24 hours you'd be like, hey, you know, if you just begin thinking this or doing this? Yeah, I would tell people that they have to have to start again. It, th there's a difference between understanding in our head that God is our creator and we're dependent upon him to actually making that the practice of the life. And, uh, and one of the tricks that the devil uh, gets onto people who are good hearted and who have no intention to choose evil is that he overextends them with good, good responsibilities. And so he overextends them with such busyness that they actually become so busy they aren't taking that time for their own personal rejuvenation wow. and, uh, and uh, development with God. And so even Jesus on earth took time away from all the good things he could do to spend time with his Father every day. So I would say, r look at your life and commit. You said earlier, you know, the love others and uh, as we love ourselves. Uh, well, the first rule of, of caregiving is the health of the caregiver. Yeah. If we don't take care of our own health, then we become disabled. And so I would tell people to step back and make a priority for your own spiritual health, mm. which means you have to take time, not just for physical rest, but your own spiritual rest and your time in personal relationship with your creator yeah. uh, in growing your own um, sense of internal well-being with God. That That is prime. And then after that, then you can go forward to being practicing those principles and how you deal with others. I love it. I love it. Well, I want to promote your book, The God-Shaped Brain, How Changing Your View of God Transforms Life. Everybody ought to go and grab your book as quick as you can. I so love Dr. Jennings and all that I've ever experienced from him. Uh, Dr. Jennings, your work on the Conquer series with Dr. Ted Roberts and puredesire.org, that stuff is just gold. And I've listened to it over and over because of the way you break the brain down and make it so accessible to somebody like me. Um, I have, uh, have absolutely loved it. Is there anything else that you've got going on, you're excited about, uh, something that you, uh, you could share with us, uh, maybe promote from your, your, your ministry and, and life? Well, I would love people to know about our website. We're, we're a not-for-profit Christian ministry called Come and Reason. And our website is comeandreason.com. And on our website, we have tons of free resources. Our ministry is a sharing ministry. And if you're in the United States and you find anything on our site that you like, um, we, get, we, we ship out our DVDs. Most people aren't using DVDs anymore because we're streaming. But all those uh, lectures and resources and Bible study classes and podcasts and so many things we have there that are free for people to use to help them grow in their personal development in their relationship with, with our Creator God. Oh, yeah. I second that, man. I, I affirm everybody 
ought to go check out your website. Well, thank you so much. You are, I don't mean to uh, placate you or speak to, you know, overreaching, but you're a boss, man. I just, I love who you are. Thank you for giving your life to learn the things that you've learned because it's made me a better person. It's made me a better leader and I'm still growing and I'm metabolizing a lot of the things that you've uh, dispensed in, in your work. So anyway, thank you so much and look forward to hopefully another interview sometime in the future. Would enjoy it, Patrick, and thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today. You might be wondering, well, what's next? I want to encourage you to go to our website at redinkrevival.com. There you're going to find our resources, retreats, upcoming special events, and a growing bank of content. We're trying our best to increase what is resource available to you. Just be patient with us as we grow and as we do put more content, but make a habit of going to check it out because we believe that there will be things that will catalyze change in your leadership. Sign up for our free e-newsletter to stay abreast of all that's available. And when our newsletters begin to roll out, you'll already be on the list. Of specific note, we're hosting our next Red Ink Revival Leadership Retreats for pastors, spouses, church staff, and all other leaders very soon. And I hope everyone can make it to one of these life-changing events. The dates and more info is always at redinkrevival.com. Well, everything that we're building is to resource you to be a wholehearted leader. I'd love for you to be a part of our tribe, and I can't wait till our next episode. I'm glad that you are with us. We can't wait to see you next time.